Hi, everyone. Welcome. So excited to be with you all here at this really important conversation. Um, I just want to start by thanking Haymarket for being willing to host us and John for doing the tech. Um, and a special thanks to Community Justice, Justice Exchange, who really pulled this together, especially Pilar and Atara, who have been really focused on helping um, mutual aid groups, bail funds, and also other kinds of groups who have been shocked by what happened in Atlanta and curious about how uh, we can continue our work and be prepared for the kinds of conditions um, that are facing us. So really excited to have that conversation today with some really brilliant um, people working at the front lines of this. We didn't want to take our time to read bios. So um, folks are going to post in the chat um, the bios of all the speakers so that you can learn more about those people. Um, but I'm just going to dive into a few opening words about mutual aid just to kind of um, put us on the same page with some of why we think mutual aid work is so important and why it's often criminalized um, and endangered when it's most needed and why we need to keep doing it even when it gets sticky. Um, so John, if you could go ahead and bring up my slides, that would be great. Thanks. I thought I would just start us off with a couple images that kind of speak to the power of mutual aid to me, um, which are on their way up. Great. Can people see them right now? Because I actually just can't see them. Oh, oh, great. I will shift over so that I can see. It's very complicated, <laughs> this lifestyle. OK. Um, so I, I, that's interesting. I'm looking at the YouTube page, and I can't see them. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, I'm going to just pull my, my slides up on my own computer and then I can remember what they all are in order. Okay. So um, I starting with uh, an image um, of just like COVID food mutual aid. This is like, you know, kind of a lot of what we saw at the beginning that I think introduced a lot of people to the idea of mutual aid who weren't already part of movement structures that use it. If you can go to the next slide, John, just these images of people doing, um, you know, giving out large amounts of food um, to people in their communities. In the next slide, um, these are images of um, people doing medic support at the 2020 uprising, um, uprisings in different cities, you know, people just providing this kind of grassroots support to help people stay in the streets. Um, you know, people giving out water and uh, masks and supporting each other with tear gas injuries and kind of all the dangers that happen when we fight the cops um, and get attacked by fascists in the streets. Um, a really powerful kind of mutual aid. Here's an image from Seattle and Duwamish land where I live. We had this, maybe people remember this uh, um, police free zone that emerged when the police left one of the precincts here and, and the kind of architecture of, of those kinds of occupation moments in our movements. What it looks like is a bunch of mutual aid, right? This you got the no cop co-op, you got people giving out food and people were um, giving out tents and doing hair and nails and giving each other mental health support. Like this is what it looks like when we take space in our communities. It looks like mutual aid. That's what makes it possible for us to do that. Next slide. I also wanted to share images, of course, of the kinds of disasters we're facing in the global ecological crisis. This is an image from the Walmart parking lot um, after the fires in um, California in um, 2018, people living outside together, facing smoke and um, you know on the run from the fire and also dealing with criminalization there. And then one more image, image of people um, rescuing each other during Hurricane Hugo. Um, so just thinking about the many things we understand to be our communities showing up for each other to save each other's lives, knowing that FEMA, isn't going to do it and isn't doing it, knowing that um, it's on us. It's on us to survive and resist. Um, and next slide. The the key piece here that I think we all share in this conversation is that mutual aid is not just volunteerism. It's not just complementary to FEMA or to capitalism. It's not just like be nice to your neighbor in like a you know um, volunteerism way. It's a really deep. Um, part of our theory of transformative change. Um, and 
if you can bring this to the next slide. A lot of what this is about for me, how I think about this is how um, we live in a context where there's a mythology about social change that's very damaging and demobilizing. And that mythology tells us that social change is going to come from on top. It's going to come from government, corporate media, and elites like deciding to do the right thing, like deciding to, you know, stop polluting or deciding to, um, you know, stop having a, a racist police state or whatever. And it tells us that what we should do is have a few special charismatic leaders who can appeal to those elites and change their mind. Um, and it tells us that ordinary people kind of don't have a role in this, except for very passively like voting or donating or posting on social media, or maybe once in a while going to a march. But it, it tells us that like the action is happening like in Washington, D.C. or your state capital or with a nonprofit or with an international organization. And that most of us kind of do very little. And that is by design. Right. And and the reality. Next slide, please is of course what we know that social change happens when huge numbers of ordinary people organize to fight back and to disrupt what's happening and to make it impossible for the violence to continue, whether that's stopping the pipelines or shutting down prisons and jails or whatever the case may be. And that injustice is not a result of like elites misunderstanding something and we could just make them understand and then we'd be free, but instead that injustice is a result of domination. Um, next slide. The images that come to mind for me most strongly in this is, you know, the reality about the Montgomery bus boycott. It's just such an example where, at least in elementary school, it was narrated to me as kind of being about a couple people like Martin Luther King giving speeches or Rosa Parks making one act of civil disobedience. But in reality, it was like thousands of working class black people, especially women, um, doing a giant mutual aid project of um, transporting tens of thousands of black people to work without the bus system for over a year um, that made that happen, right? And so just really trying to unearth like the fact that everyone has a role, that this isn't um, something that a couple of charismatic people are going to get us through. Um, I love this image of Georgia Gilmore on the left, who was um, someone who was involved in making tons and tons of these food projects to raise money for people to buy cars to use to drive each other around during the boycott. So just the the the, the depth of uh, working class black women's um, role in this. And just one more image, next slide, of course, that I think people in the US look to a lot, the um, mutual aid projects, the survival projects of the Black Panther Party, um, such as their free breakfast programs that were such a powerful moment of um, of uh, community coming together, consciousness raising and organizing, and that were viciously attacked by the police in every um, jurisdiction where those were happening, right? The police destroying the food, um, right? The criminalization of mutual aid is not new and it's something we should anticipate and strategize for. Next slide, please. So, you know, as I mentioned, these myths about social change that are so common are very demobilizing us for us. And they encourage us to limit um, our resistance to passive or symbolic acts. I think this is even more complex in the age of social media where we can have exhausting online debates that ultimately don't have a ton of material impact in the world, um, but make people feel like they've done a lot. Um, and a lot of this mythology is about expecting somebody else to save us. And our communities know that um, it's on us to save our own and each other's lives. Next slide. I love this image by this artist, Roger Pete. Um, we're all we really have. Um, that that phrase it means a lot to me. We're all we have. We're all we need. Um, next slide. So um, mutual aid. We think when I think about what that term means, I think about it um, as the part of our movement work where we're doing material support to survive existing systems, to help people have housing, food, childcare, healthcare, transportation, uh, connection, the basics. And it's only mutual aid in my view, if it's based in a shared analysis about root causes. 
that systems are to blame for crises, not the people in crisis, which is like the opposite of charity and social services, which treats people like they're the reason, like there's something wrong with them for being unhoused or for being hungry or for being in crisis. And it's also only mutual aid, in my opinion, if it includes an invitation to collective action. Like, hey, yeah, we're giving out tents and water. Also, do you want to join this? Do you want to be part of it? Do you want to fight against um, this injustice with other people facing this? And you don't have to to have this stuff from us, but it's an invitation, it's an on-ramp to get more and more people involved in transformative change. Next slide. I love this image by Seth Tabachman. The government does not care. We, the people, must help each other. This feels to me like it really captures the moments we're living in. Last slide. So just to be clear, our opponents are going to attack our mutual aid projects. Um, that's that's going to happen. It's happened to people all throughout the histories of resistance that we are part of. Um, governments will surveil and criminalize mutual aid, which also includes using not just the criminal law, but also regulations like shutting down your food project because of some kind of health and safety code or your free clinic, like, you know, using whatever regulations are in place that are supposed to protect people, but actually can be used just to keep only the professional and capitalist versions of food or healthcare or whatever going. And we also have to face right-wingers and fascists surveilling and harassing us. We see that, we're gonna hear more about that today, so so much um, pressure and, and danger from that. And our only option in this time is to keep doing this work and to rely on each other for the best ideas about how to keep it going, even though we're under immense pressure and difficult um, circumstances. So that is what today's conversation is about. I'm so delighted uh, to be here with this really um, brilliant set of people who've thought so much about what these challenges look like and how we can approach them. And I want to encourage folks that we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So if you're having questions during the session, you can put them in the YouTube chat and we will collect them. And um, I will pose them to the speakers towards the end. So please feel free to throw your questions out whenever and we'll get to them later. I'm gonna hand it over to our first speaker, which I'm remembering now is, forget, Kim out, thank you. <laughs> How are y'all doing? Can y'all hear me well? Good, good, good. Um, thank you all for allowing me to come on and to speak. Um, I thought it was really important when asked, uh, particularly the lens of using mutual aid or talking about mutual aid to discuss Cop City was, uh, a lens which I don't think has been used enough or talked about enough when it comes to Cop City. Um, and so before I get sort of deep into it, um, I want to let folks know that many of the organizations, even since the earliest iterations of Fighting Cop City, have been involved in some kind of mutual aid work. And they actually extended a lot of that mutual aid work um, when they started doing work against Cop City. Um, for instance, the, the, the folks who are responsible for starting uh, the Atlanta Solidarity uh, Fund uh, also helped start Food Not Bombs in Atlanta, um, which was a mutual aid support work, which still is ongoing, um, and which there was exactly as Dean was describing, uh, interchange between those who were receiving uh, and those who were giving political education, uh, call outs to find out more ways for people to get involved and to fight back against the reasons why in the first place they needed mutual aid um, or desired to have the support of mutual aid. We ourselves as community movement builders during COVID uh, started a mutual aid program, which we now call a liberation program, which is more, let's say, inclined with a black liberation struggle uh, in terms of what uh, uh, sometimes they're called, but they're basically the same thing. You know, we um, work, most of the work that we do are is in an area called Southwest uh, Pittsburgh. Um, that's where our base is in terms of Atlanta. Uh, there's an area called Pittsburgh in Southwest Atlanta, where we started with first just filling a gap where people could get out of their house, their homes, by sending them or finding out how they uh, what resources they needed in terms of uh, groceries and toiletries, and we started supplying that. And as we sort of slightly came out the most overt forms of COVID, uh, we continued that work and that work sort of expressed itself and blossomed 
into where we now feed up to and support up to seven, 70 families every two weeks in Southwest Atlanta through a mutual aid program. And that includes uh, folks who come to get their packages. First, we do a political education series. And that political education involves everything from what is capitalism, what is socialism, uh, uh, what is a food desert? Uh, what is police violence? How does police violence contribute to gentrification? So we really try to hit hard on issues that we think are important for folks. Those folks participate in the political education classes. Uh, they help distribute food. They help pack food. They help us find other families and individuals who need the resources. Um, and so in that way, it's a true mutual aid program that we do. Um, and again, that goes on. Even when we were folks were at what we now have dubbed Walani Park um, or Walani Forest, one of the uh, contributions that was made early to uh, fighting against Cop City was providing food and toiletries to talk to people um, about the idea of what Cop City was, um, what it meant to build Cop City in terms of tearing down the forest, and what it meant around Cop City, particularly in terms of over the continued over-policing of black and brown communities in Atlanta, as Atlanta continued to gentrify, working class and poor folks were pushed out of Atlanta and continue to be pushed out of Atlanta. And of course, the interesting aspect of Atlanta is that Atlanta dubs itself as the city too busy to hate. It dubs itself as the black Mecca. Um, and it is under the guise of black bourgeois leadership that Atlanta has depopulated in terms of its black population. Atlanta used to be 60% black, working class, poor, obviously some people with means, but majority working class and poor people. It is under is over the last 30 years that Atlanta has depopulated in terms of its black population from 60% to approximately 49%. Um, and that's happened again under this black leadership. And so one of the reasons why we in instinctually started working on Cop City was many of us came out of the 2020 uprisings, right? When uh, George Floyd was killed, Breonna Taylor was killed, in Atlanta, Rayshard Brooks was killed. We saw that the building of Cop City was an attempt, while people were talking about uh, um, uh, 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 finding alternatives to public safety, abolition of the police, defunding of police, uh, Atlanta decided to double down. Um, Atlanta saw the uprisings as a danger to the so-called Atlanta way as a challenge um, to the fact that these uh, uh, democratic so-called liberal black politicians were serving the interests of corporations, developers, and a wealthy white upper class in Atlanta. Um, and that through Cop City, uh, what they would do would be to continue to depopulate and or gentrify and or ethnically cleanse Atlanta uh, for that population, while at the same time they would be challenging the same movements that were challenging police violence. Um, and so the same movements that were organizing again in 2020 and before that to stop police violence, Atlanta decided to double down and to build out this militarized or attempt to build out this militarized police training center um, that, again, would challenge uh, the very folks who were organizing against police violence in Atlanta. We recognize that right away from the, the largesse of it. Um, the, uh, the structure of Cop City was uh, and or is scheduled to be maybe the uh, one of the biggest police training centers in the country, even though the Atlanta police force is no bigger than the 20th biggest police force in the country. Um, originally, in its original uh, uh, iterations, the uh, building of Cop City was supposed to be a place where there'd be over a dozen firing ranges, uh, where they would have uh, a landing pad for a Black Hawk helicopter, um, where they openly talked about practicing uh, against civic unrest, crowd control, urban warfare techniques, where they still, to this day, call their center a center that will be a paramilitary center and one that would be of military grade. Uh, we later found out through uh, open records requests that not only would they be training the Atlanta police force there, but that 40% of those scheduled to be trained would be trained, uh, uh, would be officers trained from outside of Atlanta. Uh, and so officers or police from around the country um, and that they would be trained on similar uh, uh, tactics and strategies which again were meant to harm uh, uh, the larger black population in our estimation 
and again, organizers and activists who are fighting against police violence. Uh, and then in addition to that, there was already an international training component to Cop City because the Atlanta police already trained with the Israeli police. Um, and in training with the Israeli police, uh, we know that that will be taken to the campus of Cop City if it is allowed to be built. And so what we always say when we talk about it, particularly in this international perspective, is that the same tactics and strategies that are used against Palestinians are going to be imported here to be used against black and brown communities and organizers and activists, and that the same tactics and strategies used against black and brown communities and organizers and activists will be exported to Palestine to be used against Palestinians. And so this symmetry of police violence, police tactics, police strategy makes this issue not just an Atlanta issue, but an issue that is both national and international in scope when it comes to challenging those who wish to make sure that capital prevails over the interest of working class people and poor people. So we thought it was extremely important to highlight the fact that uh, uh, that Cop City was going to be coming to a city near you if it was allowed to come to Atlanta. Already there's discussions about other types of cop cities, uh, other training grounds which are attempting to be built across this country um, that are e either equal or slightly smaller than cop city. But basically we're talking to extended military, military size bases for so-called police training. Um, and so that became extremely important for us to highlight, to talk about, to organize against. And the state struck back, right? The state did not just allow us to organize, even in our earliest iterations of organizing, when we were doing what you would consider to be classic uh, organizing techniques, marches, demonstrations, town halls, uh, calling your local official, all of those type of techniques were still targeted by the police in Atlanta. Um, people who were in marches and demonstrations were arrested at, uh, uh, at some of those marches and demonstrations. At that particular time, the arrests were geared towards things like things that we were used to, but we would fight back against, right? So things like uh, uh, disorderly conduct or resisting arrests or obstruction of governmental administration. Things that, again, organizers and activists who've been doing uh, any kind of uh, street organizing are used to getting. Um, things we would protest or fight back against, but we were used to getting. As this movement continued and continued to grow, um, and as part of this movement shifted into uh, the forest defenders movement, which happened after they passed the lease, uh, which in it itself was a form of mutual aid, because what we had was folks who were organizers and activists who actually moved into the forest, uh, stayed for a certain particular uh, state, either indefinitely at that particular point in time, actually were living there, or would make frequent trips back when they would offer support, they would build out camps. Um, those th that that enterprise or that 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 tactic, let's say, led to national and if not international attention on this issue of cop city it is then that the atlanta police department formed a task force a task force with the dekalb county police department the georgia bureau of investigation the federal bureau of investigation homeland security and various prosecutorial offices throughout the state and counties in uh, in georgia um, that is when they decided to start with charging folks with domestic terrorism. Um, and it is during that time period um, in December of last year that they raided the force, arrested approximately six people, charged those folks with domestic terrorism. And then in January of this year, they raided again, uh, arrested an additional six or seven people, charged them with domestic terrorism. And it is at that point that they killed uh, Manuel Tortiquita Taran, a young forest defender who was living in the forest at that particular time. Um, after that, there was another series of arrests after a downtown demonstration and another seven people who were arrested and charged with domestic terrorism. And then later on in March, uh, yet another 23 people who were at a, a music concert who, was arrest who were arrested and also charged with domestic terrorism. What's important to point out about a lot of these charges is, one, that the state, uh, and when I say the state, I mean the city police, the state police, and the federal government, that they particularly charged and targeted folks who were out-of-towners to uh, pinpoint a narrative that they were trying to give around how it was out-of-towners uh, who were stirring up this trouble, outside agitators, as they would say. And as Dean mentioned, the idea of outside agitators um, uh, is something that was used against people like Dr. King, and particularly used by Southern segregationists 
against people like Dr. King. And so that was part of their narrative. They would let people who had a uh, driver's license or ID connected to Georgia go. And those who were from out of town, out of the state, those folks would get charged with domestic terrorism. What's also important to note about the domestic terrorism charges is that the overwhelming majority of people who are arrested on the charge of domestic terrorism were arrested while uh, in the forest, in their tents. And so the only actual crime that they could have been committing at that time, and some weren't even committing this because they were on public land, were acts of civil disobedience and direct action uh, by standing, uh, by staying in trees or being in the forest that they had designated to be cut down for the building of Cop City. So I want to be clear on that, that the overwhelming majority of people were not engaged in what you would call property discussion, uh, property uh, uh, destruction. But even those folks, they're already charges if they wanted to so charge people who they uh, had arrested doing that with property destruction. But that was not the charges. The point was to criminalize the movement. And that is what they attempted to do. Um, later on, I'll wrap up uh, really quickly. Later on, uh, they targeted the Atlanta Solidarity Fund itself with uh, um, with charges of, of uh, money laundering. Um, and again, the Atlanta Bail Fund itself is a form of mutual aid. The overwhelming majority of donations that the Atlanta uh, Mutual Fund receives is from many uh, from everyday people who donate to that fund for it to be redistributed to organizers and activists when they are arrested doing, or anybody I should say, when they are arrested doing uh, demonstrations and so forth. And so it's very important to understand, I know someone else is gonna talk a little bit more about um, mutual aid, but it's very important to understand that mutual aid has been around for over a hundred years. It was instrumental in terms of the civil rights movement. Many working class people, poor people, uh, only were able to participate, particularly black folks in the South, were only interest, could only participate in, uh, in the activities of the civil rights movement because they were assured that they wouldn't have to spend overnights in jail, in Southern segregationist jails, if they were arrested because they had bail funds which would allow them to get out. So the city, the state, the federal government have targeted these, this infrastructure of organizing, of movement building, uh, just as they have targeted mutual aid across the country because they understand that targeting the infrastructure of movement is targeting the movement itself. Um, and that's part of the reason why this struggle continues, because not only do we understand that Cop City must not be built because of, again, the over-policing that will continue on oppressed communities, but again, because Cop City will be a lair, a place of planning and training for them to continually target movement activities, which challenge oppression against all of us. And I'll stop there. I'm from Brooklyn. It's hard for me, from me, but I'll try. Great. Sorry, I am. I am remembering. I'm sorry. I'm like looking for my document about who is up next. It's very embarrassing. But is it Zora? Are you up next? No, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Great. Excited to hear from you, Kelsey. Sorry. Um, hi, uh, so I'm joining today from the Yellow Hammer Fund, which is a reproductive justice and abortion advocacy, former abortion fund out of Alabama. So um, Yellow Hammer really got it started, uh, its start from a need for funding for abortion in the state. Um, we were a state that was already heavy hit by abortion bans. And I think a reoccurring theme that you're going to see that has just been hitting me pretty hard while I've been listening um, to the two uh, former uh, speakers is that really truthfully, our abortion fund existed because of the attacks on abortion rights and access and just reproductive freedom in our state. And um, our work became very significant and um, important as our abortion fund grew because we were able to serve more people and we realized how very significant the state's attacks on our rights to access care, um, the way that we had whittled away the places in our community where we could access abortion care and had created new obnoxious 
um, terrorizing almost um, regulations that really restricted when and how and how many visits and how much work you must miss and how much child care you must pay for um, to receive that care. So we were happily providing abortion care even under uh, uh, funding for abortion care even under all of these bans and restrictions um, up until the Dobbs decision, um, which was the Supreme Court decision in June of 2022 that upended our protected right to abortion across the country. So I want to really lift up that while that right was protected, our right to access abortion was not protected. So. Um, what good is a right without access? I'm not quite sure, but this was the final nail in the coffin that allowed um, many Southern communities um, and communities in the in Midwest to enjoy at least some availability of abortion care. Um, we were fully expecting that we were going to continue our abortion fund, but it was going to shift in um, the wake of the Dobbs decision. We expected that our work was going to look more like uh, the practical support side of our work, which means that we were caring for the needs outside of just the funding for the abortion, which is huge. Um, that can cost anywhere from 600 to two, three, four, five thousand dollars, depending on where you're going and what's going on with your pregnancy. But people are also having to pay for travel, um, either gas to get out of state or a plane ticket or a bus ticket. Um, people were having to uh, pay for child care, as I mentioned, because all too often you either don't want to deal with having to transport a child to this clinic that you're visiting out of state and, you know, hotels and just how difficult it is can, to travel with a child, especially a young child that doesn't understand why you might be traveling. Um, we were helping people with wage reimbursement because they were having to uh, step away from jobs that had no protections of sick hours or vacation leave. Um, and all the little things that happened in between. We were literally giving people money so they could buy snacks for the road trip because you deserve to have your bag of Fritos and your, you know, your, uh, your candy that you love on a road trip because this is not a fun road trip. This is a road trip to go receive care that has been stigmatized. This is a road trip to go receive care where there might be protesters violently trying to prohibit your access to the facility you're visiting. So um, we were prepping for just how our work would shift, how much more difficult the case management would be, because when you're having to meet all these extra needs, it involves more time. It involves depending on these resources that are already facing criminalization in other areas, um, looking at you, SESTA, FOSTA. Um, and uh, we were just trying to figure it out. And then our um, attorney general, um, the day of the ruling came out and said that not only was abortion criminalized in the state, but anyone who aided and abetted abortion would also be facing criminal prosecution for a conspiracy. Now that had an immediate chilling effect. Um, I literally received a phone call at 8 p.m. that night from one of our board members who had spoken with a lawyer and was like, we have to cancel all outstanding um, pledges for support. If you have a practical support you haven't sent out yet, you cannot send it out any longer. And we have to cancel all of our standing agreements with clinics for funding because we cannot legally do this anymore without exposing ourselves and our clients to significant legal risk. Now, Alabama has said that they weren't trying to criminalize people who have abortions. That's always the, the sanitizing factor for an abortion ban. The thing that I think allows them to pass and not face like unified outrage because even pro-life people want access to abortions in certain circumstances. Um, and they don't want women put, or women, um, put in prison for having abortions, right? Or so they say. But the reality is, is Alabama has already tried to criminalize pregnancy outcomes for so many people. Um, there are people who have had their children taken from them at delivery and their um, futures facing extreme criminal penalties because of things that were outside of their control during their pregnancies. We have had people um, charged with attempted murder uh, for being shot in the stomach by someone else because they quote unquote instigated a fight. Um, Alabama has no problem going after a pregnant person because that pregnancy outcome wasn't ideal in Alabama's limited view of what ideal is. So we knew that this wasn't just going to be limited to people who have abortions and the AG made it very clear that um, this was a goal to really chill any support that people can receive. 
Um, we see it so clearly in how all the other mutual aid efforts that have been attacked and criminalized, like that that pattern and that effect. Um, we see that it's very clear that when we circumvent the bans and barriers that they put in place by just throwing money at the problem, which is what these bans and barriers ultimately created the biggest uh, issue for, was just funding and resources. Um, they had to find another creative way to come after that support to prevent us from doing what they know people in Alabama were going to need to access abortion care. Because an abortion ban does not prevent abortions. It just makes it harder for you to get the abortion that you are inevitably going to get, or it forces people into um, parenting decisions that they were not ready to make or unwilling to make. Um, we additionally um, just had concerns about uh, the risks that um, if we decided to test this, um, you know, while we as an organization, um, we aren't willing to actually subject ourselves to arrest at this time, especially arrest in Alabama. Um, the majority of our board is black. Um, the majority of our staff are non-white and that can be an absolute immediate death sentence um, in so many states, but Alabama has really horrific prisons um, and jails and people die all the time um, just awaiting sentencing. And um, we just at this time weren't willing to risk that. But more importantly, we knew that this would then open up the cases of the people who depended on us for support to that criminalization pipeline that they may have already gotten sucked into by the state. So it just it was not an issue we were willing to mess with. Um, on a personal point, it's been heartbreaking. Um, we still have people reaching out to us to request resources. Um, we were funding about 2,000 people a year before the Dobbs decision, and we were barely touching the amount of need in the state. I, I want to touch on that. Like 2,000 people sounds like a lot. That was maybe helping 25 to 50% of the people that reached out to us, and with a lot of pain and labor to scale up to continue to increase our resources for people because there were so many barriers and so many new things they were dealing with. Um, but we, uh, sorry, I got a little bit, all oh right, I was getting into the, the after effects. Um, we, not only was that chilling effect like felt because people could no longer access care, but when we expected our phone line to be exploding with phone calls, people were not calling us and it's because they were terrified. People are terrified to Google abortion in the state of Alabama. They're terrified to look up that information. And it just became very clear that we had to adopt a completely different response to how we were going to reach people and reach their abortion needs. Um, we've done a lot of things. Um, some things that really resonated with me was that, you know, that mutual aid must invite you to join. And one thing that we did in the immediacy was we reached out to people who had been involved with Yellow Hammer Fund and um, the various aspects of our work, whether it was abortion or family justice, we do a lot. Um, and we invited them to join a fellowship program where we really got them prepared to talk about a variety of reproductive health issues and needs because we do know that people are going to fall through the cracks. People who would have had abortions are going to go on to birth and potentially parent um, or go through the trauma of adoption. So we wanted our communities to be ready to receive this information in ways that we aren't currently receiving information, which is online and Googling and social media. Um, and so we did our, um, our, our fellowship and then we also launched a reproductive resource center on wheels, um, the repro Raven bus, as we call it. And, um, that bus brings the resources and the knowledge and information that people need um, to their communities. We partner with folks that are on the ground. Yellowhammer is already kind of on the ground in a lot of communities just because of the way we work and the way that we involve the people who have interacted with us. Um, so we've just been trying to spread our abortion resources that way when we are facing this threat of criminalization. Um, but to really just wrap it up, I want to share some good news about what we are trying at Yellowhammer and what we hope will be fruitful for other people that are facing the specter of criminalization for their mutual aid work. 
is we are suing the Alabama Attorney General um, for our right to resume our abortion fund and clarify that we will not be thrown in jail um, and facing criminalization and disruption of our lives for doing what we know is just and right and fair and valid. Um, we know that abortion is legal and states right next to ours. Um, we know that people need help getting across those state lines. We believe that we have the right to drive them across those state lines or send them 500 bucks on Venmo to drive them across those state lines. So um, we're excited to report back on what happens. We won't see any movement on it anytime soon. Um, we expect some changes maybe by the end of the month. So uh, just follow the Yellowhammer Fund if you wanna learn more about that. And I'm sure this network will also report back on any successes we have. And just thank you for inviting us to this conversation. We know abortion makes people uncomfortable, but it is a lived experience of so many of our lives. I've had abortions and um, the mutual aid efforts surrounding abortion access is so important and so vital to making sure people maintain that access. Thank you so much, Kelsey, for all the work you're doing and for sharing that depth of the experience. Next up is Atara. Hi everyone, um, uh, first talking slide, um, John, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I wanted to talk, uh, sort of zoom out, um, everything that Kamau and Kelsey just talked about as so moving and emotional and tough and strong and really shows how, um, even in the face of, especially in the face of attacks and criminalization, how people who engage in mutual aid um, do it with joy and love. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit for the next 10 minutes or so about how the criminalization of, of mutual aid is intentionally used to suppress a movement and to suppress movements itself, um, not just criminalize individuals and not just attack individuals, but to actually attack um, a movement and the work to build a better world. Um, so just to with some clarity to say that the criminalization of mutual aid, whether it's directed towards individuals or orgs, attempts to undermine movement organizing and chill acts of community care through isolation, ostracization, destruction of structural integrity, and then criminalization. Next slide, John. I'll talk about what it looks like. Um, it looks like right-wing media attacks. So, Everyone who engaged, who has engaged in this kind of mutual aid um, is subjected to right-wing media attacks of doxing or threats of violence by individuals and also media. Government investigation, the chilling effect of having your attorney general specifically attack you or investigate your organization or you individually. And then legislative strategies to increase the criminalization of mutual aid through criminalizing or regulating acts of solidarity and protest. You know, one of the things Kamau really talked about was sort of the escalating levels of police interaction with what we have normalized as protest acts, um, going from um, going from arrests for trespassing to acts of domestic terrorism, um, from making it hard for people to access abortion care and then actually telling an organization and individuals that they will be arrested for conspiracy if they drive people, you know, a few miles down the road. Um, and then it escalates to arrest, prosecution, and incarceration. Next slide, John. And this is what it does. It doesn't just have a chilling effect on the individual. It limits our ability to actually do our community care work. Um, we cannot feed the people that we intended to feed or bail the people we intended to bail. Um, and it has a chilling effect on funders and allies. Movement is not just the people doing the frontline work. It's, you know, coordinating circles of support around individuals and around organizations. Um, it's not just the people who are going and posting the bail. It's also the people who, you know, provide money for um, for cars so that people can go to the to the jail. It's also the people who fund these organizations. It's the people who talk about them to their co-workers. There are concentric circles of support around individuals and organizations. And it isolates the people who need help the most from movement comrades and resources. Fear of arrest, fear of investigation, 
for already vulnerable populations and already vulnerable communities means that they are further pushed underground and alone. Um, and it instills fear and anxiety in activists, comrades, and allies, which is intentional. This isn't accidental. It's an intentional counterinsurgency action to isolate us from each other. When mutual aid is all about creating communities of care and connection. Next slide, John. Kamau already talked about this a little bit, and so did Dean, um, but that this isn't new, right? Um, so historically, the civil rights era saw sweeping arrests of anyone engaging in political acts of solidarity and mutual aid that were pushing back against what Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls the organized abandonment of the state. And this included protesters, black power activists, and police watchdog groups. And it's no mistake that the same people who were doing like food breakfast and food aid are also doing protests, are also doing anti-capitalist work, and are also pushing their governments for better things. We end up doing everything, right? We end up filling need where we see need being, and then also intervening at a higher level. We do the individual work, and then we invite people to help make change. And those indictments worked to scare the public, right? So to ostracize people who were caring for their communities from the public at large, and to send people scrambling to pool financial resources to post bail and mount legal defenses. I cannot stress enough how much of a time suck and a financial suck legal defense and bail is. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars. In Atlanta, a few of the protesters have had bails in the six figures um, for the same you know, stories that we all have of being at protests. And that's an enormous amount of money and resources that you have to give the state in order to get someone free. It's 100% worth it, but they make it hard on purpose. Next slide. And then I wanna just say with some clarity, I think everybody has sort of built to this, that building communities of care and mutual aid for people in jail, for protesters, for migrants, for houseless people, for people who use drugs, people who seek abortions and trans people is both an act of solidarity and mutual aid and an act of protest. They are both at the same time. And because they are both, we need to know that the anti-dissent and anti-protest laws have been increasing since at least 2016 with Standing Rock um, protests and the 2020 uprisings, where there have been 23 states that have expanded the criminalization and increased punishment for protest with more pending and active prosecutions in at least 14 states. That we have this understanding of mutual aid as being an act of protest and at the same continuum as dissent and protest, and so does the right, and they are criminalizing it accordingly, right? So specifically making acts of protest illegal or impossible. And they're doing this because when we act in tension with the system, which is what we're doing, the system will use their law enforcement power as a weapon against organizing and movement work. And that the charges that are levied against people don't need to stick and the prosecutions don't even need to happen for behavior to be impacted, for people to be punished and for allies to distance themselves. Next slide, John. So these are just some examples of protest related criminalization. So there have been, and there are in places where you would not be super surprised by, um, but there aren't only in these places um, where there have been extreme penalties for protest related actions. So for something like the obstruction of a sidewalk can carry a one year jail sentence in Tennessee, in Louisiana, for a pipeline trespass that carries a five year sentence. And some of the other categories are vague and overbroad laws where a riot includes anyone present or the imminent danger of property damage. So if you're a person who's providing medical care at a protest and the state has decided that, that qualifies as a riot, you can also be charged with a riot. It includes the expansion of liability. And so that's financial penalties. Um, so private financial penalties. So in Oklahoma, there's a conspiracy to trespass near a pipeline statute that carries a $1 million organizational liability, right? Which means that if you are an organized organization, if you're a mutual aid group or you're any kind of formation, 
um, that the state has decided is guilty of conspiracy to trespass near a pipeline, and a, and a million dollar judgment just like wipes you out, right? So it's not just a criminalization of individuals, but it's also making our organized organizations and our formations bankrupt and taking more money. It also encourages violence against protesters. Um, and there have been a couple of uh, recent vindication, well, recent not guilty um, uh, sort of prove, provings of this um, in Iowa specifically, where civil and criminal liability exists, liability immunity exists for injuring or killing a protester who's participating in or blocking a road during a riot. So it's the government saying, if you kill someone while they are protesting, that's fine. Um, and then there's just broad and political usage of state and federal terrorism statutes. So Kamau talked about the Georgia domestic terrorism case, but I wanna also mention that in Florida, there's four people who uh, are accused of graffitiing a crisis pregnancy center, and they are being charged under the Federal FACE Act. So they're being federally prosecuted in Florida for the FACE Act is a law that was ostensibly passed to protect abortion clinics um, from right-wing protest and violence. But I think as we all know, the law is used by the government in ways that is useful for the government, not necessarily that is useful or protective of the people. Next slide. And then we see examples of individual and organizational criminalization with the usage of existing laws. So human trafficking laws are usually the legal schema that states are using to criminalize the assistance of people who need care out of state. So in Florida, it's now illegal to transport an undocumented person, undocumented person into Florida. Um, it includes a maximum 15 year prison sentence and also racketeering charges, which carry a 30 year sentence. And in any state where abortion is illegal, threats of human trafficking for transporting people out of state for access to abortion services have extreme chilling effects. And it's also the usage of things like medical licensing laws to prosecute people for giving people abortion pills or other kinds of medicine. Next slide, Jen. And some other examples are election laws in Georgia. It's illegal to give people food or water within 150 feet of a polling place. And then we have what's been hap what's happening in um, Atlanta, which is financial management prosecutions, right? So this is not something when we go into this work, we think we have to deal with. We do not think when we're doing mutual aid that we have to worry about our charity statutes or money laundering or RICO laws, but it is an extremely chilling and effective way the government has to go after organizers who are just interested in feeding the people and helping people and making connections within between people. So prosecution under federal and state charity laws and money laundering, which Zora is gonna talk about in more detail in a minute. Before I hand it off to her, um, I just wanted to talk about our understanding of charging and assessing risk when we are engaging in this work. Um, risk is not foreign to us, right? Like this is something that we are aware of when we get into this work. And part of what makes us strong and able to do it is that we have a realistic understanding of the risks that we might take, right? So Kelsey talked very specifically about what was at stake should they risk a risk and the choice that they made, right? Centering the people who are most at risk in their organization and first the people who are there helping. Right. And so when we're thinking about understanding charging and assessing risk, we should always know. And when we're talking to each other, understand that these charges are chosen deliberately to create fear and chill organizing. And so regardless of whether it's a risk we're willing to take, we should be always pushing back against them as being scary, shameful or violent. They are not those things. Right? We understand the landscape and the choices that we're going to make, but when we talk to each other and when we talk about the world, we don't talk about our work as being scary, shameful, or violent. Because we know that this is familiar to us. We see every day in our communities how law enforcement and prosecutors use upcharging and specific allegations to sound scary and serious and to make us afraid of each other. Next slide. And then lastly, 
knowing the difference between vague charges and complicated charges, which is like a reductive way of talking about this. So at some point, I'll have a better way of saying it. But vague charges, they encompass and criminalize behavior that is an act of community care that the government has decided is a crime, right? So driving someone across late lines, giving someone water or food, providing medical aid or access to medical aid, we know that as community care. And the government has said that that specific act is now illegal. And so we are understanding that if we engaged in that act, that is something we could risk arrest for versus complicated charges, which require strict adherence to legal schemes where organizations or individuals would benefit from the advice of experts in navigating them, right? So money laundering, charity fraud, if you have a good bookkeeper, you're probably okay, right? But it sounds complicated, it sounds hard, and it is complicated and hard to follow those rules, but as long as you are, you're probably all right, right? So reaching out to accountants, bookkeepers, or lawyers in order to adhere to the law. So we need resources that we don't usually rely on in order to make sure we can avoid arrest in those situations. Um, and that's it. I'm gonna pass it off to Zora. Thanks, Al. Thank you so much, Atara. That was so immensely helpful and really appreciate that idea that we we know we know we do risky work and part of how we can do it is through having mutual aid like jail support, like supporting each other if the work becomes riskier. So just really appreciate your framing so much. Zora, take it away. Um, hi, all. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Atara, for laying that foundation. Um, I'm going to talk about the legal strategy that the Attorney General in Georgia has put forward in um, the case against the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. Um, and the reason I'll do so is just to kind of talk about how the state puts the case together, how it um, intimidates, how it uses the law to intimidate, how it uses jails to intimidate, and then to think about how should we respond, right? And I think we're in this tricky place because we know that the law is not really a restraint on law enforcement, right? We can't be naive about that. And yet there are strategies at our disposal to be able to fight them on their own terrain. Um, and we sort of, we need to be able to keep um, an eye on both realities, right? That like th they can do whatever they want to do ultimately. And yet um, we have to have a very cl clear and we can maintain a very clear eyed way of sort of fighting them on their own terms. So um, in the um, preliminary hearing um, of the Atlanta Solidarity Fund and in all of the preliminary hearings and um, bond hearings, and Kamau will know this better than me, um, the attorney general or the, or the district attorney starts with these like really magnificently broad characterizations of facts. And at no point in these really broad descriptions of things that go back three, four years do they mention a single person's name? They use the word, they use the pronoun they, and it's not because they're trying to respect someone's preferred gender pronoun, it's because they are literally, have no idea who the people are, the people are interchangeable because they wear black clothes and because they share a critique of the state. And so for the first five minutes of all of these hearings, the attorney general just says they did this, they were part of this group, they were part of that group, they were part of this group. It's they, 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 without any specifics. And then after a judge or a lawyer asks for like, wait, wait, so, so is this the defendant that you're talking about? And the attorney general says, well, literally, I'm just asking for a little leeway here. Just give me some leeway. So this is how these cases start, right? Which is no real specific allegations of fact connected to an individual where like sort of the building blocks of criminal law, none of that, just broad characterizations. And it's only upon sort of pushing back and asking very specific questions that you sort of see that the prosecutor's cases are sort of very weak, not, not much meat on the bones as the judge put it in the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. Um, if we could move to the um, slide um, on charity fraud. So the Atlanta Solidarity Fund is charged with um, two charges, charity fraud and money laundering. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of words on the screen. Um, I've put it there just so you have it. 
but if the next slide um, really breaks it down. So if we could go to that one, please. 34. And so the essence of charity fraud is claiming that you're raising money for charity, but you're not actually raising it for charity. And most of the cases, the person's raising charity, raising money for charity, and they're just pocketing it themselves. That's sort of the quintessential charity fraud case. In Georgia, there's very few cases on this. And I think that's interesting because we know the criminal punishment system is mostly directed at poor black and brown folks. And charity fraud is a new idea for the prosecution to take up precisely because they're sort of figuring out that criminalizing mutual aid is a way to push back on black and brown communities. But precisely because at least the prosecution, prosecutors tend to think of charity as a white middle class phenomenon, there's no case law, there are no prosecutions, right? So this is an area of like developing law. So I tried to look into this, it was like very little. But the core of charity fraud is you're saying you're fundraising money for um, to buy food for folks, and actually you're just pocketing yourself. It, the key of it, the, the, the heart of it is misrepresentation. Now, the attorney general is alleging against Atlanta Solidarity Fund that they have reimbursements that these reimbursements show that the Atlanta Solidarity Fund was raising money and that that money was not going to the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, but to another fund for people who were in the forest. Now, the problem with that, there are many, many problems. Like, what are these reimbursements, right? So again, they use these words. They have no evidence to really back it up. But the real issue is that the prosecution is alleging that if I pay for someone's food, if I pay for someone's gas, and that's why I'm fundraising money, and that that person happens to use their body or their car to later on commit a crime, that I'm on the hook for that as a, as a charity. And that's truly preposterous because that then puts every single act of charity at issue. And even the liberal judge understood that that was too broad of a conception of criminal liability. Right. So the government is trying to criminalize something much, much broader than the statute provides and basically says, if you happen to give money, happen to give in kind goods to someone who later on does something illegal, then you're liable. And this is a definition that, you know, this is a kind of construction that I think is apparent that is sort of preposterous even to judges. But you kind of I can I can understand why this would sort of scare you. And it would, you know, it would, as Atara and Dean are, are pointing out, it would make people sort of suspicious of each other, suspicious of wanting to provide aid. Um, but if you look at the statute, and again, not to say that these statutes are going to save us, but the statute itself requires someone to misrepresent, to say, I'm doing, I'm buying, I'm, I'm fundraising to for food, but really what I'm going to do is um, make Molotov cocktails. No bail fund is doing that. Doing that. Right. So these charges are being used to um, whip up frenzy, to whip up fear um, with very, very little evidence. But if you look a little closer, some core principles of criminal law are just like don't don't comport with the prosecutor's um, interpretation. If you could go to the next slide, please. So. The next charge that they have brought against the um, Atlanta Solidarity Fund is money laundering. And that requires someone to have taken money from an illegal transaction and use it in another transaction. And th in that transaction, they're disguising that illegal activity or they're trying to further the illegal activity. Of course, the money laundering charge requires some illegal act to have occurred. I don't know what the illegal act is for the Atlanta Solidarity Fund is, but it seems maybe that the prosecutor is saying that the initial charity fraud is the basis for, for the money laundering, is the illegal act is the basis of the money laundering, but they don't spell that out. And it goes back to what Atara is saying. These charges may not stick. That doesn't mean that they're not something that we should think about, that we should not, something be, be, we should not defend against. And yet we also know that there's a lot of missing details in these charges a lot of missing pieces, a lot of evidence that they simply do not have 
that they would be, you know, they would be eager to present at the preliminary hearing if they did, and they simply do not have it. The sort of the longer, I think, um, story around charity fraud and money laundering um, that I think is worth remarking on is that these prosecutions, um, especially in the federal context, really took hold after 9-11 against Muslim charities and charities supporting Palestinian rights. Um, and so we should see this criminalization of mutual aid, the criminalization of solidarity um, as part of a larger uh, trend, in which case what you have here is the state taking the tools of the federal government and applying it to its own um, left um, groups but that these strategies are one that have been really um, masterfully honed in by the Bush administration, by the Obama administration, taking down people for simply giving food in Gaza. And if the recipients of food happened to be members of, of Hamas, they were charged with material support to terrorism. And yet the crucial difference between those terrorism prosecutions and the, and, the, and the money laundering prosecutions here is that even in the federal prosecutions, the individual had to know that the person receiving it was a known terrorist organization. And even that, and in this case, clearly um, the attorney general does not have that kind of evidence against the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. But this is, I think, just a, a way to show how kind of the boogeyman of terrorism has infected so much of law enforcement um, and is um, being used by attorney generals, um, really, I think, for atmospherics, um, but obviously with 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 great um, impact. So I will um, end here because I think that's enough law, lawyer, law talk for everyone. Um, and I'll turn it back to um, Dean. Thank you so much. It's all so clear and helpful. I'm really excited that this is being recorded and lots of people can use it. I'm going to turn it over to Pilar for the final word, and then we'll have Q&A after Pilar. Thanks so much. Um, it's, I've, it's an honor to be at the end of this panel of amazing people. Um, I'm going to just talk really very quickly, but not too fast for our interpreters, um, about how we protect ourselves. So hopefully, John, if you have slide 37 is where I'm going to start. Um, so, um, and I think some of this, we just want to kind of pull out, you know, we've been talking about all these, you know, it's really hard to listen to so much of this violence that people are experiencing, um, right, and our comrades in Atlanta, our comrades in Alabama, it's just, but there are things that we can do to protect ourselves. And so I think we want to just kind of walk through a few of those. Um, one, and we've talked about this a little bit, is really centering who is most at risk, right, when we think about how we're going to fight back against these kind, this kinds of criminalization. And I think, you know, Kelsey's example about what the Elhammer Fund has been thinking about really hits home, right? It's like, we're going to make different choices if individuals are going to be prosecuted than if an organization that has, you know, they have the built-in solidarity of like, we have a board, we have maybe even have insurance, there's people who can be in front based on their positionality that's going to be, you know, a different assessment of risk if, you know, people seeking an abortion or people who are walking through the forest or are just living, right, are going to now be individually um, criminalized and prosecuted. Um, I think something that, and Dean has put some really helpful resources in the chat for folks, is that a lot of times when mutual, like when these like charges around money laundering and the sort of the scary language that makes people start to not trust each other and question, are they quote unquote guilty, is because we're moving money around, right? And this is legal, um, right? Buying food, buying tents, getting people, you know, to their doctor's appointments, paying for bail, this all involves money. And it, you know, that's very different than a lot of ways, you know, resources are often hoarded, right? So I think one of the ethos of many of us in mutual aid, formations is like you are moving the money out as you get it because you were trying to help as many people do the thing that you're set up to do, whether it's food, abortions, travel, bail. That's all legal. The, the state doesn't like it, right? It's built on solidarity. It's built on resistance. But we need to be able to really 
work together and evaluate and have clear, we can do this, right? There's nothing illegal about saying that you're going to run an organization that does a thing and then do that thing that involves moving a lot of money. So just really making sure that we feel comfortable that, about that. A lot of us, right, like when it comes to money, we we go into all of our different discomforts, right? And being okay with that we need to have accountants and bookkeepers and there's movement resources in this area. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and we can protect ourselves, right? It's not illegal to spend a lot of money um, doing acts of solidarity. Um, oftentimes also we've noticed with, you know, this has happened with bail funds, with other mutual aid formations, that if you're a fiscally sponsored organization or you're your own 501c3, um, there's what's considered quote unquote normal accounting and bookkeeping, right? People are used to like, you know, operating a food pantry or, um, you know, doing some sort of like, there's a service, they pay for it. There's very like regular monthly bills that might be different than really a lot of in and out of money because of the way that mutual aid formations might be reacting to a crisis. The difference is often targeted, but it's not illegal, right? And so sometimes we need to talk with, if we have a fiscal sponsor, if we have a board of directors, we need to do our own internal education to make sure we have the accounting structures of this very, you know, we this is like what Atara was talking about, like complicated laws versus our vague charges, right? It's like, there's this very complicated system that's meant to restrict, right? 501c3 activities are meant to restrict our political, act, you know, our political acts of resistance. They were set up intentionally, right? So we have to figure out how to follow them. It's not, it's not impossible. It's not even that hard. It just is a lot of roadblocks. And so sometimes we have to do that internal education that there are slightly different accounting systems that are totally legal, but need to be taken account of if our work is slightly different than what is considered a quote unquote, like normal nonprofit. Um, I think another area that we think folks can really think about um, as an offering to, to protect each other is making sure that we always keep our fundraising disclaimer language really clear and updated and not be afraid to update it, right? Sometimes a group will say like, we're doing a fundraiser and every penny is going to be spent to free this person and then that person gets free, well, then we need to update it because now the money they're coming in, right? And again, it's one of those things of like, these systems were set up to have a lot of barriers to try to block our organizing work, right? And so it's just helpful to always keep that in mind. It's a very easy way to make sure we're up to date, um, but it is an area that I think sometimes is used against us, right? As an intimation of some kind of guilt. Um, next slide. Um, and I think, you know, this, we wanted to just kind of reinforce that we, you know, one of the, the ways that, you know, organizing in solidarity and in mutual aid formations is being really nimble and creative, right? I mean, it, the things that people have done in different crises, right, and are the daily crisis of living in, you know, under capitalism, right, is people are doing all kinds of things. We have to meet all kinds of complicated needs. We're fighting back against the state. So we get to use all the legal resources that are disposable, which including our charitable status, right? So I think a lot of this charity fraud sort of intimation that we hear sometimes, you know, when people are being criminalized or targeted, right? It's it's very intentional isolation tactic, right? Um, we get to, the, you know, the 501c3 statutes were created, we can follow them. The state may not like that, right? They don't like the politics of our work, but there are ways that we, just because we're following the 501c3 laws does not, and in, in a political orientation that is against the state does not make it illegal, just means that they don't like it, right? And we see this all the time where corporations and wealthy individuals and sort of more corporate nonprofits are sort of like celebrated for being smart because they figured out how to use tax law to like reduce their tax liability, right? Or they figured out how to use a tax credit. And that's considered good when it's like, you know, white led, you know, capitalist endeavor, but suddenly it's a group of neighbors doing this, you know, helping each other. And it's viewed as like, that's some sort of criminal enterprise. So just being really clear about that language. Then I think two final things, and this is mentioned before is, you know, we know that so much of this is done to scare and isolate us and to, and to really break organizing formations, right? Come out and Dean have talked a lot about the sort of historical grounding of when we've seen this happen you know, over decades and decades, it's intentional. And so we have to really be, you know, we have to keep it together with our, in our own formations to not really use and repeat that language, right? When we are, we're using it in ways 
to educate each other and to support each other and to like break that, that, you know, like to bring people back from these isolation moments of being scared about what is somebody doing, right? Because we saw, you know, an example that Zora is talking about and that Kumau was talking about with the Land Solidarity Fund. In the immediate aftermath, we just kept seeing people repeat the charges and kind of like, oh, did that happen? Right, and we've seen that a lot in 2020 in the uprising where if domestic terrorism charges were being used in Oklahoma, suddenly people were like, well, maybe it was, right? And we have to just really work and support each other to to not repeat that language and to not sort of perpetuate that, you know, it, it, it's scary, right? They're, they're really intentionally using the scariest charges possible. Um, and then our final offering is just really to ask for and offer support. I know John's gonna put a link in the chat and if folks wanna get in touch with us and we'll, we'll, we, we can try to be in touch and respond to folks who might wanna be connected to accountants or bookkeepers or, you know, other thinkers who are really supporting all of us to make sure that we have the tools to fight back, but to also, you know, be offering cross movement support, right? I mean, we were, we're so happy that we have the Yellow Hammer Fund, right? Doing this absolutely vital reproductive justice work in the South and also, you know, come out and the like, stop cop city things, right? We, like, these are not like, we're not trying to have isolated, like this is only happening over in this movement and not over here. So we're really offering support and learnings across different parts of our movements um, to learn from each other and support. So thanks so much. And I'm going to pass it back to Dean. Thank you, Pilar. So useful. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat. People should feel free to put more in. But I wanted to start with one. Someone asked a question along the lines of how do we assess risk? Um, when we're planning actions. There's so much to say about this, obviously depending on like what kinds of actions we're planning, but I know that you, everyone on this call has a lot of wisdom and experience about how those conversations go in groups and, um, and how we avoid the chilling effect that folks are mentioning and also be really smart and take care of people. So I was just wondering if like anyone wants to start um, uh, with some thoughts on, you know, where you've seen risk assessed in a smart way or, um, how the groups you're part of do that. I can start, Dean, um, and then I'm sure other folks can pitch in. But um, I think one key place to start is who would be risking the most. So sort of centering the most vulnerable people in your orbit. Um, and uh, when I've been when I've talked to Kelsey about sort of how they have assessed that and I've compared it to the work of a lot of our bail funds, it, it becomes very clear, right? So when a bail fund goes in and posts a bond for somebody, that is not really risky for the person who is getting free. They are the person at the center of this. They are already in jail. They are already in the riskiest situation they can be in. And posting bond is an act of liberation for them. And the person taking on the risk is the fund, if there is one, right? Um, and so centering that person helps you create this sort of risk um, map. But at an abortion fund or a place where someone is just trying to get health care or trying to get assistance, the threat is against them. They are the most vulnerable, right? And so you cannot take a risk for someone else. You can't. You can only take a risk for yourself. Um, and then you can take a risk with the people that you are in community with, but you can't assume risk for somebody else, especially the risk of arrest. Um, and so I think that's a good place to start, right? Which is which is who on whose behalf are you taking risk on? Um, and then where are they situated, right? Who are they? Like we mutual aid is based on knowing each other and on understanding where we come from, what our privileges are, what our risks are. Um, and if you have that strong community and space, um, that helps you create that map. I don't mind jumping in quickly, um, and I and I do think it's a, it's kind of a difficult question when I uh, start to think through sort of the history, what it means to struggle against oppression and movements, right? Um, and and some of this is around qualifiers, around what our role is within movements, um, and so there are some movements where. Uh, risk accessibility is quite different than some of the sort of grassroots above ground organizing we do today versus what other groups have actually done within the United States to struggle against oppression. 
Um, so I usually start with making sure that folks who are taking a risk in these days, usually a risk when it comes to grassroots organizing is around civil disobedience or direct action of some kind, is know who you're struggling with, know who you're organizing with as much as possible. What is the purpose of the risk? How does the risk fit into larger tactics and or strategies and or plans? Um, is it a viable risk that um, uh, furthers your movement? Are you careful about who's proposing the risk and what that risk is, right? Um, how well do you know people who come into meetings and say we should do ABC? And I'm not going to mention what ABC are, but they're fallouts far outside what we think our normal role is in terms of uh, above ground, I, I like to say, organizing, right? So we have to take into account those things. We have to take into account in terms of assessing risk. What do we have structurally set up to mitigate that risk once it's taken? i.e. whether or not there are bail funds, do we have lawyers on call, do we have legal observers for sort of like public demonstrations and marches and, and so forth. Um, and then lastly, I'll, I'll say that we must take risks. So we must not be frightened by the fact that the state obviously has tools, um, which can be scary for us all, right? It can be scary for people to think about being arrested and what that may mean for them in terms of other life pursuits. But that is what the state counts on to maintain and retain control over our lives, over our bodies, over our communities, over our people. And so we have to be able to assess what it means to take risk, but we must also be able to, within the assessment of that, actually take risk to challenge the authorities that we believe are oppressing us. Zora, Kelsey, Pilar, any other words on this risk assessment question? Okay, maybe I'll just throw in another another question that came up that I think is um, maybe we want to speak to, you know, when should a group be trying to work with a bookkeeper or have a lawyer on call? Like, how, how do you know? Do people have any thoughts on that? That, um, you know, it's kind of a next level, please, Kelsey. Yeah, so um, I'm going to share both lessons learned um, and things that we have done that were really helpful for us. Uh, as soon as your organization can figure out a bookkeeper, get one. Um, this is something that has really hurt Yellowhammer Fund um, in the past, was just not having like a consistent bookkeeping practice and hiring people to have to play catch up uh, is a lot more difficult than having those practices in place and everyone adopting them in your org. Um, it's something that we're struggling through right now as we face the prospect of a lawsuit um, because we also face the prospect of an audit. And an audit is when you really, really wish you had a bookkeeper who from the start. And I know that that's not realistic. Um, I was really excited to hear that there is a potential to like get a list of values aligned, um, people who can do this kind of nitty gritty work for your org, because that's a whole other consideration. You know, as an abortion fund, we will not bring someone on to do that work who is hostile towards abortion access or hostile towards a lot of other things that we work towards as an org um, because it, it's a disaster. Um, and then as far as like something that I'm really proud of us doing is we have always prioritized having a lawyer available. Um, this really happened after uh, a ban that was attempted in 2019 by the state of Alabama to ban abortion, um, but that was unconstitutional at the time. Um, and in the wake of that, we saw um, our first big criminalization case that we were able to get involved in. Um, and it was not related to abortion, but it was a criminalization of a pregnancy outcome case. Um, and it was important for us to be involved. And we maintained that relationship with the lawyers that supported that. Um, and they were the ones that were able to advise us um, and keep us from getting into a position where we endangered one of our clients inadvertently because we hadn't yet heard the AG's statements um, because this was not, it, it, what led to us pausing our services was literally a news interview that the AG did that we just happened to catch. So um, I think, you know, it's, it's a issue of access for sure, um, but if that's something that your org can prioritize um, or that you can network with others who already have those resources to start exploring. I think it's important. Thank you so much. We just have one minute left before we need to wrap up. Um, I want to offer Zora, do you want any last words on the question that Charlie posted? Yeah, it's a, a really big question, but I think, you know, we have to work to distinguish 
the HL case. Um, and you know, we have to distinguish the material support cases from our cases where there's the government is designated another group as a terrorist group. That's not an issue here. And so, um, yes, we have to know what the worst case scenario is, but I don't think that's a scenario that we're in right now. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here and thank you so much to Kamau and Zora and Kelsey and Atara, the interpreters, Pilar, John. Um, this has just been a very rich conversation and I know we'll be continuing it. And I hope that people who are watching will also you know, notice that the, the webinars we posted and the links have links to other people who are providing this kind of advice and support so we can all just keep reaching our tentacles out to support us when we're doing this work and trying to assess how to move through a risky time doing these really important interventions. Thank you so much for being with us. And please share the video with your friends if you think it would help folks continue the work.